Welcome everyone, if you could take your seats, we're going to start the next session. And there will be a coffee break after this, so caffeine is in your future. <laughs> so, I want to thank FIA for sponsoring this, and we have General H.R. McMaster, former National Security Advisor, and I've also known you in previous roles um, in Iraq, et cetera. And now you're at the Hoover Institute um, in California. And I just listened to a, an excellent uh, podcast this morning, Battlegrounds, where you interviewed Kai Sauer from the Finnish <laughs> Foreign Ministry. Yeah. So um, I want to start on some of that conversation. Uh, when I tell people that I'm traveling to Finland, to the Nordic region, and hey, they're the new NATO member, right. I get a quizzical look. What would you tell Americans that Finland, the Nordic countries, what do they bring to the NATO security structure? Right. Well, thanks, Kim. And it's a real honor to be with you. And I don't, you, if you don't know Kim's story, please look it up. You know, we often celebrate the courage of our soldiers and oftentimes don't pay enough attention to how courageous our, our journalists are. So, so HR likes to start with interviews with journalists by embarrassing them. So thank you. <laughs> So and it's, what, a, what a privilege to be at this tremendous conference at this really critical time. And you know, Finland, Sweden bring tremendous capabilities to NATO. And, and I think some of them are tangible and easy to understand. Finland's model, for example, of mobilization, the degree to which you can integrate reserve forces with active forces to present a very formidable defense to a potential aggressor like on your border, for example. And I think that's a, a model that applies to, to many other countries, including uh, an aspirant member of NATO, Ukraine, who we know uh, we have to support uh, so that Ukraine, for example, can be free and independent and secure and, and get back on the, on the path to prosperity. That security is going to rest in large measure on their ability to, to continue to, to defend themselves and to deter uh, any future wars once they win this one, which is, I know, what we all hope is going to happen. But also the, you know, the Baltic states, for example, and just and then and then of course there are other tangible, you know, really easy to understand benefits associated with the security of the Baltic Sea. If you think about, you know, the the, the potential the aggressor to the to the east, uh, there's a, a tremendous strategic dilemma that that that, that aggressor faces now, uh, that Russia faces, and uh, and then also in terms of Arctic security and the important strategic. Uh, you know, the, the growing strategic importance of, of the Arctic. Uh, so I think there are just so many tangible, but there's also less tangible benefits, for example. I think at a time when people have doubts about their agency, their ability to secure their future, if you look at Finland's history, the history of the Winter War, and you see an example of, of a much larger country attacking a smaller one and the degree to which a people can generate the will uh, to defend themselves, I think that's an important sort of almost spiritual and, and, and emotional uh, benefit that Finland brings uh, to, to, uh, to NATO and, and certainly, I think, is a tremendous example for Ukraine at this moment as well. Now, they're working on a defense cooperative agreement with the United States that would involve basing U.S. troops here. Mm -hmm. There is a concern inside um, Finland. They, their law prohibits having, for instance, nuclear weapons on their territory. But what would that bring to be able to, for you as a planner, yeah. um, if you were able to plan to base forces here, what does right. that bring? Well, I think, I think what it does, is it brings a complete commitment, right? I think when you have forces that are permanently stationed somewhere and the families are there, it deepens the relationship from military to military. Uh, and, then, and then also it, it, it provides typically tremendous logistical benefits. It's really difficult oftentimes to go into uh, a, you know, a theater of operations or, or to, to improve defenses if you're not there at all uh, to begin with. So it's just a, it's a continuous ability to coordinate. We see the benefits of this now, of this now with the rotating forces into Poland, for example, and the degree to which uh, U.S. forces position there a headquarters built now for that purpose is really strengthening collective defense um, in, in, uh, in Europe overall. So to nerd out a bit, um, NATO uh, already had a cooperative agreement with Finland, with Sweden. What does stepping it up do for NATO? Well, what, what, it, what it does is it, it just, it, it, it is unambiguously clear uh, to, to any state who would, who would uh, threaten Finland's security that 
that uh, that, you've, that, you, that all of NATO is brought will be brought to bear against that state. And of course, you know this is this is the case with uh, you know with with Russia that Russia uh, is is provoked by the perception of weakness or the perception of the the lack of will and and uh, the the latest re, you know the reinvasion of Ukraine uh, that occurred in February of, of last year. Uh, you know, fits a long pattern uh, of, of aggression uh, in the, since the beginning of the century. And, and I don't think that's going to go away, even in the weakened state that we see the Russian armed forces in. Well, to pivot to Ukraine and Russia, if you were briefing POTUS right now, the commander in chief yeah. of the U.S., uh, what would you tell them about the state of Russia? Yeah. Well, I, well I, for, about the state of the war in Ukraine or the state of, uh, about Russia? Russia's overall. will, Putin's yeah. will to prosecute this war. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that, that at the stage of the war now, Putin has to know he can't have Ukraine. But I think what he's concluded is that, is, is that if, if, if uh, Russia can't have Ukraine, if Putin can't have Ukraine, then Ukraine can't have Ukraine either. And so we're seeing a phase of the war in which Russia is doing everything it can uh, to, to attack, obviously, Ukrainian infrastructure, the Ukrainian people, to continue that onslaught, to try to slowly choke Ukraine out by denying them access to the Black Sea, by restricting you know, their grain exports, for, for example, attacking the electrical infrastructure, blowing up the dam is another, almost a symbol, a very destructive symbol of what he intends to do to the, to the entire country. Uh, the ongoing threats to the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. All of this is meant to try to crush Ukrainian will and ensure that Ukraine cannot, you know, cannot remain as a viable state. He's also obviously attacking our will through the sustained campaign of political subversion that we've seen Russia engage in since Putin came, came into power, uh, and the sustained campaign of cyber-enabled information warfare, as well as other forms of political subversion, supporting extreme parties, um, propagating all, all sorts of conspiracy theories that are meant to diminish, uh, are the cohesion of NATO and the willingness of NATO, the EU, other nations uh, to, to support Ukraine. That's going to continue. I would also say that Putin will escalate wherever he can get away with it. There's a lot of talk w w whether he would use a tactical nuclear weapon. I, I don't believe that's a c the case. Of course, you have to take that seriously, but I think it's highly unlikely. But what we're seeing are, are a range of actions Russia is taking to escalate horizontally. We've seen that with how Russia has been using energy for course of purposes. Now, now food supply for course of purposes, political subversion across, uh, across Europe, uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, we, we've seen, um, we see what happened to Georgia a, a few years ago, what, what, he's, what he hopes to do in Bulgaria. So this is going to be a continued effort uh, by, by Russia to create more and more problems for us to diminish our will. And then, of course, there are other actions that Russia's taken in, in, in Africa, for example. He, Russia is continuing to enable the serial episodes of mass homicide in the Syrian civil war. So, I mean, I, there, when people talk about an off-ramp for Putin, mm. <laughs> an off-ramp for Putin is just the opportunity to look for the next on-ramp. And so I think it's important uh, to, to recognize that the only way, I think, to, to reestablish security uh, in Europe is to convince Putin that he's been defeated. And that means not allowing him to take, keep any territory? Does, does, he, does so. he keep Crimea? I don't think so. I mean, I, here, here's... Here's what I would love to see, and this is what I would advise any, uh, any head of state, is that we have to work with Ukraine to provide a higher degree of clarity, clarity in what our objectives are. I mentioned already what I think the overall political objective should be, which is uh, you know, a free and independent, secure and prosperous Ukraine. That's the end state we should, everybody should be supporting the Ukrainians to help them achieve. Then, then what, what is necessary militarily for that? And I think that there are two fundamental military objectives at this stage. The first is to prevent Russia from continuing the onslaught against the Ukrainian people and against Ukraine's critical infrastructure. The second objective is to assist Ukraine in developing the capacity, the capability, to conduct a sustained offensive of sufficient scale to regain all of the territory taken since 2014. And I think with that clarity, then, we could begin to have a discussion. You know, How? what kinds of weapons do we need? How, in what quantity should we provide? But we, now I think we're in, we're in a situation where when we say, as long as it takes, if you don't define it, it's quite easy to confuse activity with progress. But if, if President Biden says, for instance, we're going to support Ukraine for as long as it takes, everyone knows there's a clock running on that. 
the length of his presidency, the will of the American people. Uh, you've just laid out a really ambitious program to take back not just the Donbass, but Crimea. That could take a decade. Well, you already seen the Ukrainians take steps to try to neuter uh, Russia's military capabilities on, on the Crimean Peninsula. And I think that's what's necessary. I think just looking at the map and the Crimean Peninsula relative to Odessa and the importance of the Black Sea coast and unimpeded maritime traffic to Ukraine to make to help Ukraine be, remain viable, mm. then I think you recognize that, that, uh, that Ukraine uh, in control of Crimea is needed as, as well just for its long-term security. Would you give them attackums, long-range missiles Absolutely. that could reach, but yes. couldn't they reach far into Russia? And well, what would stop know, Ukraine from hitting far into Russia with those like they're doing with the long-range drones? I think long-range precision fires that can place assets of value to Russia at risk with it conventionally is going to be immensely important to deterring further Russia aggression in the future. So if you look at the range of capabilities that Ukraine would require to, to accomplish objectives now, uh, to, 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 to reestablish control of his territory. Uh, you, you have to look at that, but also look at the longer term capa uh, uh, capabilities that, that, uh, that Ukraine will need to, to preserve wh whatever peace or, 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 you know, or ceasefire would come out of this after they regain control of their territory. And I think long range precision strike capabilities are important for that, just as, as Japan, for example, has concluded that it requires long-range precision strike capabilities. If your company, if your country comes under the attack of these of long-range systems, you have to have tiered and layered air defense capabilities and radar capabilities to shoot down the arrows, but ultimately you also need the capability to kill the archer. Otherwise, you don't have really an effective uh, mil uh, missile de uh, uh, defense capability. Would you have given them long-range fires and F-16s earlier? Would you have yes. been pushing for it? Years ago. Years ago. And, and you know, in the, in the discussions that we had, you have to remember in that first year of the Trump administration, it was the first time that we were really providing directly to, the, to Ukrainians defensive capabilities. We were providing all sorts of non-lethal assistance. And in the discussion with, uh, with President Trump in December of 2017, I think, 2017, we'd already made the decision on a Russia strategy, and that included providing defensive capabilities to Ukraine. But of course, you hear all these arguments all the time. Well, wouldn't that be provocative to Putin? And the point that, that I tried to make uh, to President Trump at the time was that what is provocative to Putin is the perception of weakness. Weakness is what is provocative. And I showed him a timeline of various acts of, of Russian aggression, from the poisoning of a, of a presidential candidate in Ukraine in 2003, right, to, the, to, the, to various campaigns of political subversion, to the denial of service attacks on Estonia and, and, the, and the incitement of riots and so forth in 2007, the invasion of Georgia in 2008, the invasion of Ukraine in 2014. And then I overlaid other events that had occurred just prior to that, from which Putin had concluded that we were weak. In, in, such as the unenforced red line in Syria, 2013 to 14, which I think led directly to the first invasion of, of Ukraine under the, the belief that the, the United States NATO is not, are not going to do anything. And President Trump's response? Uh, he signed the memo to, to provide and sell javelins to Ukraine. Got it. So you won that argument. No, his whole cabinet did, and he was persuaded. This was not a, you know. At the time. Yeah. But now um, we are seeing the thin end of the wedge in um, Poland uh, and Hungary with the ban against Russian, uh, with the ban against Ukrainian Ukraine wheat imports. Right, yeah. um, Slovakia, the party that is leading in the polls, um, says not one more bullet to Ukraine. Right. right. Um, when you listen to the GOP candidates in the state's campaign, um, they've got to go, if, if someone like Nikki Haley, who is strong uh, with Ukrainian, uh, continuing support to Ukraine, she's in the minority. Yeah. How would you win over the GOP, the large part of that voting base that thinks this is good money after bad? Right. Well, I, I would just say that the vast majority of both political parties are behind sustained support for Ukraine. And what you see, though, is, is our candidates, uh, you know, uh, the former President Trump among, among them, uh, others who, who have been wavering, are, are trying to curry favor with a certain portion of the American electorate 
that I, who I think it's important for us to understand. I mean, there, if you think about who are the support, everybody talks about Donald Trump as an individual person and everything and all his flaws, which I think are important to talk about. But where did Trump come from? He didn't come out of thin air. He tapped into to a, uh, to a part of the American population that is discontented with its government, believes that, believes that its government has not acted in, in their best interests. And these are people who were affected significantly from the transitions in the global economy that occurred after China was granted most favored nation status in the 90s and was granted accession into the World Trade Organization uh, in, in, in uh, 2001. That resulted in a loss of manufacturing jobs in, in key parts of the country, and, and those people never were able to really recover uh, out of the, after those, that, those, those losses of jobs. If you think then about other disappointments, those may have included, I think, the, the unanticipated length and difficulty and cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Hey, toss in the financial crisis, 2008 and, and, two, and 2009. How about you know, an opioid epidemic on top of that? And then think about the negative effects of social media, where social media's algorithms are designed right, to get more and more advertising dollars by more and more clicks, by showing people more and more extreme content consistent with their predilections. So this is what has happened in, in America, and has happened in Europe as well, is this growing polarization uh, and and uh, and and you know, pitting uh, the, the both ends of the spectrum against one another, reducing confidence in democratic principles and institutions and processes. But these people who were discontented, they wanted a disruptor. Mm. Donald Trump was the disruptor. I mean, unfortunately, you know, his disruption included disrupting maybe the Constitution and really disrupting his own agenda. Right. So, so I, I just think. Um, it's important to understand what's going on inside the United States, but also to recognize, certainly in the Congress, that there is still a, a vast majority, uh, and, and, and across America, who continue to support Ukraine. Now, the trend is in the wrong direction. That's why I think we need clarity. We need to continue uh, to, to, to emphasize, obviously, the nature of Russian aggression, and, and to, to make sure that we don't buy back into this idea that that Putin has security concerns that can be allayed. And then there's a tendency, you know, among us oftentimes, to blame ourselves from even the most brazen and horrible acts of aggression of the other. And this is the, you know, the, the, you know, the narrative that it was NATO enlargement that, that upset Putin and so forth. Putin has aspirations that go beyond any that are in reaction to what we do. And, and I think all you have to do is read his, his long essay uh, from, from um, you know, from uh, 2021, August of 2021, and, and obviously, you know, other speeches and, and, and statements that he's made uh, in connection with reestablishing the, the Russian Empire, for example. He is motivated by a revanchist, hyper-nationalist uh, ideology, and he's motivated by emotion, I think mainly associated with the sense of honor lost uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, and this drive to restore Russia to national greatness. Speaking of, you know, revanchist leaders who um, rely on nationalism. You said something about President Trump in a recent Atlantic piece on um, General Milley's departure from the chairman's position. You said, as chairman, you swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, but what if the commander in chief is undermining the Constitution? Yeah. We had speakers at this forum already who say that the thought of another Trump presidency is literally keeping them up at night. Mm -hmm. What does happen to the United States? What happens to NATO yeah. with another Trump presidency? Well, I mean, we're not a monarchy, right? So that's, that's a good thing. Our, our, founders, uh, our founders, I think, uh, recognized the, 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 the danger of, of uh, concentrating you know, too, much, uh, too much power in the presidency. Uh, you, you alluded already to this question of, you know, what's the role of the chairman? The role of the chairman, Joint Chiefs, is nothing. No, no role in politics a, at all, I believe, because the, the checks on executive power exist elsewhere in our government, and the last thing you want is the military to become public, uh, politicized, right? So, so I think what, what, has to, what you have to do is rely on, on, on Article One of the Constitution, the Congress, rely on the judiciary, and ultimately, you have to have confidence in the American people uh, to, you know, to, uh, to vote in, in a way that brings the, the best people um, into office. The problem we have now, and I know that many of you recognize this, 
is that both political parties have evolved in a way that the big tents of those parties have shrunk and shrunk and shrunk into little tents. And then to, to be a member of that party, to be accepted within that party, you have to have adhere uh, to the party's position on a range of issues, from social issues to defense issues to foreign policy issues to domestic policy, taxation and so forth issues. And, and so there, there aren't room for a lot of Americans in these little tents, and so they're left outside of them as independents. And that's the majority of Americans now. The problem is the primary system is still structured around the little tents, and they put forward candidates that the majority of Americans are, are really not satisfied with. So, so how do we break out of that? I believe that there will be reforms in the coming years, but, but we have a difficult election ahead here as a result of, of that dynamic. If, if it's Trump v. Biden, you think the majority of the American public would choose the lesser of two evils, as well, you might describe who, them? What is the lesser of two evils? It depends on the, the, you know, the voter, right? So, I, I mean, I... I, I okay, have, what is your lesser of two evils? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. But I, I mean, I, 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 because, you know, I'm, I'm a washed up general, you know, so I'm <laughs> retired. But still, I, I try to avoid, you know, really taking partisan political views. I will criticize, I'd be happy to criticize President Biden's foreign policy, happy to criticize President Trump's foreign policy and behavior and, and, and uh, actions that undermined our Constitution, uh, that, that uh, I think encouraged, if not incited, you know, an assault on, on our, our seat of government. So, I mean, I'm happy and to I, do all that. But uh, what I don't want to do is endorse a, a candidate or, or, you know, or uh, say the way that I would vote and that sort of thing. I do remember when you were offered the job of National Security Advisor, um, I forwarded you the pool picture that someone in the pool had snapped, uh, the, the press pool that uh, follows the president, had snapped a view sitting with um, President Trump. And you texted back something that, to the effect of, A, thanks for the photo, B, <laughs> I'm serving the president, I'm serving yeah. the office. Yeah. And it's honored to be right. called to serve the office. Right. Do, do you regret? Do no, you? I have no regrets at all. So I, you know, I'd, I'd served in the Army by that point for 33 years. I served under five commanders in chief. I took the oath of office when I was at age 17 at West Point under Ronald Reagan. And, you know, I never even voted. You know, I took the, I took the example of George Marshall, uh, who, had, who, who had stayed, was very you know, uh, uh, studied in his effort to, to be uh, nonpartisan, non, non political. And so for me, I was going to do the best job I could for as long as I lasted. And, and I had written a book about how and why Vietnam had become an American war, and I thought that I could make a difference by giving the president best analysis, best, you know, uh, best access to information and intelligence and so forth, uh, and then multiple options, to develop multiple options so the president could make his decisions and, and make the best available decisions. And it, it worked for, you know, 13 months. And, I got used up in the job, as I think was pretty predictable that that was going to happen. Happen, and I was a, happened I was, quite a few people. And I was at peace with that. <laughs> I was completely at peace with that. And, and um, so, so i do it again. Before I um, pivot to take a couple of questions from the audience, I wanted to ask you about something that um, you care deeply about, um, China. Yeah. One of the Finnish presidential candidates who spoke at a, a pre-event here talked about um, that we shouldn't see China as an adversary. How do you want people to understand the threat of China? What is the Chinese military plan for us? Yeah. Well, the China, China's already implementing a plan uh, that, that is at our expense, and that, and that plan has to do with uh, a range of activities, the massive 400 percent buildup uh, in their armed forces, a 44-fold increase in their military budget since the beginning of, of, this, uh, of this century. Uh, those military capabilities are designed really to accomplish uh, uh, several different tasks. So one of those tasks is to is to be able to project power across the Indo-Pacific region, uh, to lay claim to the ocean, right, to, to own the ocean in the South China Sea, the area of the ocean through which one third of the world's surface trade flows, uh, and then to, to, to forcibly, if necessary, uh, subsume uh, Taiwan. Also, they want to isolate their, their main regional rival, Japan, in, in doing so. And so that's one set of a range of military capabilities they're developing. They're developing another set of capabilities, which is to keep the United States and others at bay so they can do whatever they want in this exclusionary area of primacy they're trying to develop uh, across the Indo-Pacific region. This, these are the so-called anti-access air denial capabilities. But also you have the fourfold increase in their nuclear forces. Uh, which I think are designed also to to uh, to keep us from intervening in the way that we've seen Putin try to use the rattling of his nuclear saber uh, to to constrain our support for for Ukraine and so forth. So, 
So that's concerning in and of itself. But then you also have to consider the degree to which China is, is engaged in, in a range of economic aggression against us. And this is the sustained campaign of industrial espionage against our companies that are meant to steal our intellectual property and our sensitive technologies and apply them to their, 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 uh, the People's Liberation Army and, and, and to gain a differential advantage over us. But it's also a range of unfair trade and economic practices associated with the joint venture law, the national security law, as it has been interpreted, and the program of military civil fusion, where Chinese companies have to act. They have to act as an arm of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. And then I think what you have to, to recognize is the degree to which uh, China has been able to gain an unfair economic advantage by co-opting, coercing, and concealing co-opting companies with the, the, with the promise of, of short-term profits, co-opting us in terms of our economic relationship with these false promises of impending liberalization of their economy or their, or their political system. But then once you're in, to coerce you, to coerce you because you've become dependent on manufacturing in China, you've been dependent maybe on the Chinese market, you've been dependent on supply chains that run through China. And should we not have learned right, from, the, from the Ukraine experience, hey, it's a bad idea to give an authoritarian, hostile power the ability to coerce you economically. That's what we've done with China, and it needs to be reversed. Whether you call it de-risking, decoupling, doesn't matter. That has to be addressed, and I think it's really important that, that we, we take almost a Hippocratic oath with doing business with Chinese entities or engaging with China. Do no hurt or harm in three areas. Don't help the PLA develop the weapon systems they might aim at your grandchildren. The People's Liberation number one, Army. The People's Liberation Army. The second is, don't help China develop the tools necessary to perfect their technologically enabled Orwellian police state or commit genocide. Right, so what are a couple examples? Let me give you just examples of that. Example A, okay, in terms of you know, the PLA, $700 million investment, U.S. venture firms, in a company called Four Paradigm in 2014. That company does all the battlefield artificial intelligence for the People's Liberation Army. Hey, congratulations. I hope you got a good return on your investment. The, se the second, you know, the second area, look at Hikvision, Sense Time, right? I'm sure you got great, people got great returns on those companies, and those, those are tools of genocide. Uh, for the CCP. And then the third is, don't compromise the long-term viability of your company uh, or your position, in, your market share, in exchange for you know, the lure of short-term profits in China, the false promise of business partnerships in China. Think about all the companies that have gone through this, right? Cisco gets their intellectual property stolen. Huawei enjoys then $60 billion that we know of, uh, of uh, and, and Nokia, others, uh, you know, have their, uh, Ericsson, uh, their technology stolen, that those subsidies then allow Huawei to, to develop the hardware and equipment for, for uh, fifth generation communications well below, uh, <laughs> well below would be, would be feasible in our free market economic systems and dump them on the international market and try to drive everybody else out of business. The same thing's happened to GE, the same thing has happened to, to you know, many companies involved in solar panel manufacturing or wind turbines. How about the battery sector? Look at what's mm. happened there. I mean, I, so, I, I have to, my, yeah. my, uh, I had a cousin whose uh, solar energy company went belly up because the Chinese right. took it over. Um, we, we, yeah. had, we, had, we had about 60 solar panel manufacturing companies in the United States about, gosh, 15 years ago, whatever, however, I'm not sure the exact time. I think we have two left, two left. Mm. So I just want to take uh, a couple of questions, one from Charlie and the lady in green. Uh, and just to sum up uh, what HR is saying about China, when it comes to Beijing, beware. So I'll just say quickly, it was co-option, coercion, concealment. There and the go. concealment is saying, hey, this is just normal business practices. It's, it's not. Sir. Go. Charlie Sun Luis Pasternak, um, Finnish Institute of International Affairs. I'd like to ask for some advice. You mentioned a long-range strike, and Finland um, made the decision a long time ago to acquire these capabilities, although in public, no one wants to say, of course, we're going to use them deep east. Um, but as, as a new NATO member, I'd like to ask you, how would you advise or suggest Finnish decision makers think about nuclear deterrence? It is something that Finnish decision makers have never had to think about. And we're at the edge of NATO's nuclear umbrella. Sure. Okay. And, um, yeah. Before we, can we just take the yeah. question okay, yeah, from? Absolutely. 
If you should introduce ahead. yourself. Yes, absolutely. Good morning, General. Um, my name is Marina Robinson Snowden. I'm with the U.S. State Department, where I work on arms control issues. Um, one thing that struck me in your remarks was the echoing to actually the Prime Minister of Estonia yesterday when you talked about um, weakness as a provocation for Putin. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious of your analysis of the rebellion in, in June of 2023 by Prigozhin and his troops going against Putin. Yeah and what the implications of that will be um, in the war in Ukraine, in the Wagner Group's influence globally, and the broader Russian foreign policy. Okay, great, great, thank you. Hey, in terms of nuclear deterrence, I, I think it's immensely important for us to look at, at Russia's, uh, as well as uh, China's arsenal, and, but the way that they intend to use it and what they tell us about their doctrine. The whole escalation domination or escalate to de-escalate doctrine by uh, you know, in, in Russia, I think, is, is, is particularly concerning. And this is the idea that, that Russia could use a, a, a lower-yield nuclear weapon first, uh, in Europe, for example, and then pose the United States and others with a dilemma, right? Either sue for peace on our terms uh, or risk nuclear Armageddon. What, what are you going to pick? So I think what that requires is, is us for, to have a range of capabilities that, such that we could respond in kind if necessary, and to have that capability, uh, we, we would hope, would, and that flexibility in response would be a sufficient deterrent. And this is, quite, this is analogous to the SS-20 Pershing missile dynamic uh, in, in the in 1980s and, and 1990s. Um, when, you know, when, when, uh, w w which ultimately resulted in the INF Treaty, which eliminated a whole class of, of nuclear weapons. But of course, we know those weapons are back now uh, because Russia did not adhere to the INF Treaty, broke it. And when you have a treaty that only one party's adhering to, it's a fantasy, right? It's not a treaty. So it was important that the United States abrogate that treaty. And I would, I would you know, really point to the Nuclear Posture Review of 2018. I think we did you know, a, a, a solid job on that in the unclassified version. So from a Finland's perspective, you have a range of alternatives you could take a look at. Uh, like Germany and the Netherlands, for example, is an alternative in, in, in terms of the way that, that, uh, that, that you, know, you could integrate a nuclear deterrent into your defenses. But of course, I mean, that's up to Finland and, and Finland's uh, assessment of, of what's required for effective deterrence. You know, on the Wagner <laughs> uprising, you know, I, I think that it shows you that Putin is really weak, I think. But you know what's important is in authoritarian regimes, you know, the, the authoritarian leader just has to be stronger than any organized opposition, right? And, and what Russia is really good at is demobilizing opposition. And we should recognize, obviously, there's still more people in the internal security services than there are in Russia's armed forces. But you did have you know, an ex-hot dog salesman, an ex-convict, take over the equivalent of Central Command headquarters. And then, and then march on, on Moscow. So Putin's illusion you know, of, of, uh, of strength, I think, is, is, uh, is damaged. But the, you know, the question is, you know, what, what is going to happen to really affect Russia's will to continue this fight and, and their armed forces? I think it shows a great deal of turbulence, obviously, in the armed forces after this, because you had the purges that followed. You had Silovikans firing. You have, what, 20 or so general officers now out of the picture. There's disruption in that, in, in that senior chain of command. But, but also, I think there's disruption at the lower level chain of command within the Russian armed forces based on the casualties that they've taken. Uh, and then obviously the ineptitude uh, of, the, of the Russian military and the degree to which uh, they've sustained you know, such high rates of, of casualties. So, I mean, what, what I'm hoping for, I don't have enough information about this, but you know, every organization has a breaking point. Battle, war, is ultimately aimed at the disintegration of human groups. And, and I believe that the Russians' cohesion as a fighting force is under great duress. And so this is what, where, what I think that uh, Ukraine needs our support at this moment to help really disintegrate uh, the Russian armed forces' ability to continue this onslaught against Ukraine. So mindful that I'm, uh, we're three minutes into their coffee time. Um, just to wrap up the two questions, if if weakness is a provocation to Russia, would you advise Finland to consider basing nuclear weapons here? Yeah, I think consider everything. But, but really, you know, it's a, lot of, a lot of the deterrent capability you can achieve, I think, is also through these long-range conventional weapons as well. You know, when, when Putin was, was waving his, 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 uh, his, nuclear saber, his nuclear saber, you know, I think one of the messages to him should have been that if you use it, it could, it's a, a suicide weapon, and our response doesn't have to be with nuclear weapons. Uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, I, th I think that should be, uh, you know, clear to him, as well as the degree to which it would place at risk every military asset he has outside the borders of Russia, 
which, you know, the Black Sea Fleet, for example, I think uh, could be gone in 30 minutes. So, I mean, I, I think having a range of conventional capabilities is important because if you can deter a conventional war, you might not even get to this threat of, of, of nuclear war. Imagine, imagine if Ukraine had the capabilities they have now before the reinvasion. We wouldn't be talking about the danger of a nuclear escalation now. And I think this applies to the Taiwan example as well. Um, On that note, thank you so much. Thanks, Ken. For coming to Helsinki. <laughs> so much to talk thank about. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks, everybody.